master's. And in 2012, I decided that I would step up to, I always volunteered for education and tutored, and I uh, mentored elementary students different times, but there was an opportunity to run for a school board in 2012 here at the County Department of Education. And so I had to run three times <laughs> in one year uh, to win this seat. These are some of my beloved students that are helping me vote for Lee because I wasn't married in 2012. And we did parades and talk to people about how we believe that all of you, all of our students, can achieve if they have the opportunity to work, experience, and uh, experience the best that education has to offer. Um, and when I ran, um, three elections, I had to win once, get to run off, I had to win the second time, and then I had to win the third time to finally have the full seat. Yeah, so you can ask questions about that later. It was very, a lot of hard work. Um, but when I won, I became the youngest person on the board, about 30 years. <laughs> the only African American on the board, period. And so that means you on a regular basis. So I'm glad that I could be on that board and let them know that our African American children can sell and are worthy of investment. And we do a lot of uh, projects in the energy and STEM field. We have provided. So that's me as a trustee at one of our competitions. So I love to focus on that. What did I see? Well, the robots have to do certain challenges, and they are electronic, and the students have programmed them to complete the challenges. So it's really exciting to see, um, <laughs> to see what the students can do. And they can each, every robot can operate differently just to achieve the same task. So it's all about the creativity of the students. Um, but anyway, I just am so glad that now I can spend my free time pursuing my passion. Uh, being a trustee is unpaid. So I do have another job that you know pays some bills, although my husband pays more than bills. And but I'm glad that I can devote a lot of my time to making policy that hopefully allow you to reach your highest potential. <laughs> and this is just my mom congratulating me. This is when I was sworn in, uh, January 15, 2013. So I thank you, and I'm going to pass it off to my beloved husband, Dr. Roy. All right, gang. All right, so if you don't, if you don't remember anything else that I have to tell you today, just remember one thing, that you can do anything that you put your mind to, okay? Don't let anybody tell you that just because you're black, or just because you're Latino, or just because you come from a different part of town that you can't do anything. And another thing that I want to tell you, this used to just drive me crazy. When I was good growing up, is that a lot of people think that if you speak proper English, if you know math, if you know science, that's for white people. And that is the biggest lie. Don't let anybody tell you that. And the reason I say that is because I work in the oil industry. And the oil industry is by far the most important industry in the world. There is no other industry as important as the oil industry. And I don't see that many people that look like us. In the oil industry. And the reason why is because we don't necessarily have the science, the mathematics, and the engineering background. And so one thing, so if you don't remember anything else I have to say, remember that mathematics, science, technology is going to take you and going to get uh, the jobs of the future are going to be in those fields. And so don't let anybody tell you you can't do it, that because you're a woman, or because you're a girl, because you're black, that you can't do it. Don't, because that's the biggest lie, all right? Those, those, are the most, those are the most important classes that you're taking right now. Okay, so now, with that said, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm from Louisiana. I was born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And so I was fortunate, but after I uh, graduated from high school, I actually left Louisiana. And then I went a couple of years up to Brown University and I came back. And I went and I got a BS in civil engineering at Louisiana State University, LSU. And so then after that, I'll, uh, the next slide is going to talk about what I did after my, my bachelor's. And then after I came back, 
I went, I studied, I got a PhD in chemical engineering from uh, Tulane University. So that's why they call me Dr. Carter. So I can't operate on you. I'm not a medical doctor. <laughs> I have a PhD, but I'm still called Dr. Carter. And so then after that, I worked at a small startup firm for a little bit. And I was doing a lot of defense work, a lot of like uh, advanced defense work doing uh, weapons. Yeah, a lot of military, like a lot of weapon systems, that type of stuff. So I decided to kind of get away from that. Went back to school, got an MBA at the University of Chicago. And so that's up, that's up on the south side of Chicago. Actually, just a, a brief aside, I was actually there right before Obama announced uh, his uh, presidency. And he actually lived in the same neighborhood that the school is at. So he used to work out in the same building that I used to work out in. And so I used to see him there all the time. And so I remember just like him being right there, right next to me. And I said before I worked for Chevron, and one of the fortunate things about working for Chevron is that it's a global company. And so since it's a global company, I've had the fortune to have the fortune to actually work in Angola, which is in Southern Africa. And so I don't know how many, is it right here from Louisiana? Because yeah, there's a big prison called Angola <laughs> in Louisiana. That's like Huntsville. It's Angola. And so when like my mother used to tell people, oh, my son's in Angola. Like, what happened? He was such a good boy. What happened? But really, I was in Southern Africa. So I spent six months there. Then I went to the Bay Area. I worked there. For, and now I'm here. And I've been in Houston for about 20, since 20, 2009, 2010. And so right now, I work as the portfolio team lead. So for the big kind of business units, so I'll make a really long story short. The big kind of business units, so we cover the middle of the United States. So that's everything that's onshore, the middle of the United States. So that's everything. So you hear a lot of that activity going on in, uh, in West Texas, like Midland, that area. So we cover that area. And right now what I do just to, uh, you feel free to ask me questions about this, but what I do is I basically help, it's strategic planning. I help Chevron spend their money so they can make more money. Because we all know Chevron doesn't have enough money. So they need help spending their money to make more money. And so that's what I help do. I just want to give you guys a brief overview of what is oil and natural gas. Because one of the things that I've seen is that a lot of our, our people don't understand what is oil and what is natural gas. And so they don't really understand even the opportunities that are out there for people. Because the, thing, the nice thing about the oil business is that it pays very, very well. And, but the thing is, you have to kind of have an understanding of what is oil and what is natural gas. Because you hear a lot about it. You drive by all these gas stations and you see the prices up there. But people really, but you have to have a basic understanding of what this is and why, why we actually go overseas and kill a whole bunch of people and start wars for this substance. Because it's like this. <laughs> so, all right, so all the natural gas you hear, they, they're interchangeably called hydrocarbons. And hydrocarbons are anything that has a carbon and a hydrogen attached to it. And that carbon and hydrogen bond is really important because what happens is there's a lot of energy stored in that bond. And so when you burn it, yes, when you burn it, you release that energy and it becomes heat. And you can use that heat to move things. And so, yes? Yes, right, exactly. And so when I say hydrocarbons, so there's a whole range of hydrocarbons. So the, the, the names that you're familiar with are methane. Methane is natural gas. That has just one carbon with four hydrogens around it. And that's in the gas, gaseous form. And then as you start increasing the amount of carbon in that, in that molecule, uh, so you go everything from methane and butane. So imagine like, like, a, like a big, a big lighter. No, 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 not you guys. <laughs> so there's so in there, you see there's a liquid in there, that's butane. And that has four carbons, four, four carbons with hydrogen around it. And so the stuff that you put in your car is called octane, which has eight carbon atoms with hydrogen around it. And the nice thing about this is that this has a, you see there's a lot of carbon hydrogen bonds. So that means it's a very powerful molecule. If you burn it, it releases a lot of heat. And so when you, and then when you, then when you burn, when you release a lot of heat, you can move heavy things like your car. And so that's basically, so that's basically how gasoline works. You inject it into your engine, and it, you basically have to control the explosions. And then that releases heat, and then that moves your car. That's a wrong. That's a really.
really that, that's yeah. A, that's, yeah, that's a that's a really long story. But basically, what happens is we take that we take the we're going to talk about how, where we process all the natural gas, but we take that oil out of the ground. And then, you know, so you go to east of Houston, and you see all these refineries. So they take the crude oil that you know, that's got from underneath the ground, and then we ship it over to the refineries, and then that turns it into things like gasoline. And then also jet fuel, we turn the gas, crude oil into jet fuel, kerosene, which is jet fuel. Then also, so that's uh, for your car, but also anything that moves, moves because of oil and natural gas, such as if you have a, a ship, ships from a bunker fuel, uh, trains run on yeah, jet fuel, and also big rigs. Those run on diesel, which is a form of gasoline, but it's a little different. Yes, for big trucks. Okay, All right, so where do we find all the natural gas? And this is actually where a lot of money is being made right now all over the world. Uh, there's a ton of money. If you can, this is one of the things that I really want to emphasize to everybody here, is that if you, can, if you understand how to get all the natural gas out of the ground, you will be an exceptionally wealthy person. This is a this is this is a very simplified version of how they do it, but a lot of people are making a lot of money right now to uh, finding oil and natural gas uh, well under underneath the ground. And so with that well, then it hits what they call reservoirs. You see these different uh, different uh, like straight strata of rock. And so yeah, basically yeah, labor rock, yeah. <laughs> And so it goes in, so we drill down, and then we hit, uh, basically, it's a pool of oil under the ground. That's, that's soaked in the rocks. And then, yeah, and so then, we, then we basically bring that oil to the, to the surface, then we ship it to things like refineries. And so that's how, that's how you get the gasoline and all the things that move, is because, because of this process. And so typically what happens is, you, when you go on the ground, you have oil fields, you also have gas fields. So those are fields that they have natural gas in. And so we then operate the same way where we bring the oil and natural gas up to the surface and then we ship it off for it to be sold and then to be used. And so one of the things that uh, I want to say, as I said before, there's a lot of money to be made in this. And so there's a lot of different fields and this is one of the things that I want to emphasize to everybody here because I really don't see a lot of people who look like us in these fields. And so you have things like engineers. I'm a chemical engineer by training, but you also have petroleum engineers. Those are the, those are the people who actually drill the wells. And then chemical engineers, people like myself, we turn crude into gasoline. And so all of the refineries that you see to the east of Houston, all of those are like built and maintained by chemical engineers. And so also you have civil engineers, which I was before I became a chemical engineer. And those are the people who design roads and bridges and the build buildings here. The buildings here are designed by architects working with civil engineers. And so geologists, these are the people that study the earth, study the different layers of the rocks because oil and natural gas only found in certain types of rocks. And so geologists and then also geophysicists would study how the oil and natural gas move through those rocks. And so these fields are like open to anybody. And right now, like Chevron is like dying to find minority engineers and scientists. Because we have more jobs than we can fill right now. And we can't find enough people with the science, technology, engineering background to fill these jobs. And these jobs are going to be like by far the, the jobs of the future. And so that's one of the things I want to emphasize to anybody here is that the oil and natural gas business is going to be a great business for the we're always going to need to move. We're always going to need to go places. And so, as long as we yeah, as long as we do that, then you're always going to have a need for engineers and people who understand science. Modern civilization yeah. depends on oil and natural gas, and that is why it is by far the most vital industry within the world. And this is why, as I said before, we go and we try to control things in the Middle East because that's one of the biggest reservoirs of oil and natural gas within the world. And so, as I said before, all vehicles that you see that are in motion, they are powered by a form of hydrocarbon, whether it's like either oil, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, those are all hydrocarbons. And so, one of the, also one of the things that people don't realize, and why oil and natural gas is so vital, is that it's also an input to a lot of different industries within the world. So look at your food supply. When you go to the grocery store, all of those, like grains, 
Those are grown by fertilizers, and fertilizers basically come from uh, petro. So when you get oil and natural gas, you turn those into fertilizers. We put those fertilizers in the fields that help us to grow more wheat and corn and those things. So basically, what we're doing is we're basically eating oil and natural gas, but we're changing it from one form to another. And um, and so that's just one of the many things. We got plastics, you got chemicals, you got pharmaceuticals. A lot of pharmaceuticals come from oil and natural gas. And so that's us. What I went to say. And so, and we're still happy to marry. But uh, but one of the things also, and as I said before, just to reiterate what I said before when I began. Remember that you can do anything you want to do. Do not let anybody tell you just because you're black, just because you don't have enough money, just because you think you go to XYZ school that you can't do anything. Okay, then just do what you want to do and go for your dreams and just just keep pushing me and uh, hard work, okay? And stay out of trouble. Don't get any tattoos, okay? Because I see a lot of people with tattoos that just, especially physical tattoos, don't do that to yourself. Please don't. Okay. Okay, okay, Dr. Kirk. He's going to leave you with some inspirational messages that they use at Stepan <laughs> to, uh, to keep them going. And it can help inspire you, whatever your goal is, whatever you're trying to do in your life.